Loving Father, you are worthy of our praise and our adoration. You have all power, all glory, and you give that power for us and to us through your Son and by your Spirit. Today, Lord, may you bless us, give us ears to hear the call that you have on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1887, Lord John Acton wrote to the Archbishop of England, warning of the danger of the church to condone its own abuses of power. And there he famously wrote, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad. Even when they exercise influence and not authority, but still more when you super add the tendency of the certainty of corruption by authority, where those same people of influence, the clergy, the church, they uphold that corrupt power. What shall we, the Church of Jesus Christ, say about power? What should we Christians say? about power. The church's history of exercising worldly power is not great. When Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, there was both gain and loss. And, and I kid you not, only God knows if we gained or lost more through what is called the Constantinian Compromise. Two of the great attacks against belief in Christianity specifically belief against the church, and they are big ones, come from that Constantinian compromise, crusades, and inquisitions. Now, these objections, I think if you dig down into the history, they end up being a little bit more bluster than substance, especially against the teaching and the way of Jesus Christ. The crusades did not originate with bloodlust of Christian conquest, it was the invasion of Muslim attackers who were advancing against historically Christian regions. It provoked the Greek-speaking Eastern Church to cry out to their Latin-speaking brothers for aid against violent and brutal invaders. The Inquisition wasn't led by the church. It was led by nation-states. Most, but not all, but most of the clergy representing moderating voices against the brutality and murder of the Inquisition. How do we condemn the response by the Latin-speaking church to its Greek-speaking brothers and sisters to come and help defend against invaders? And while the Christian religion was used by Spaniards to advance their power in their region... It was the actions of a nation state, and it was against most of the recommendations and all of the teaching. And while they claimed to be a Christian country, they were not acting in the way of Jesus. But let's be clear. Lord Acton's warning rings true. Those movements of power became more and more corrupt by the Fourth Crusade, Christians sacked and pillaged the Christian capital of Constantinople. What began early on as something with some, at least, justification for protecting and keeping peace devolved into the very worst of human brutality with no justification whatsoever. We have more recent examples in our own country of the Christian movement getting caught up in worldly power and playing partisan politics. I hope all of us shake our heads when we see, and if you didn't see, but it was there, crosses being brandished at the Capitol riots on January 6th. That is not the way of Jesus Christ. Now, our history could still our mouths to silence. Who are we to speak about power? But I want to put forward to you that it must not Today I want to make an argument, I want to offer encouragement, and I'm going to end with a question. First, the argument. 
The church corporately and we Christians individually must speak truth to power and most importantly, we must offer a better way of exercising power than what we find in the world. Two major points to this argument, speaking truth to power and showing a different way of power. The first point, it's what we were made for. The Gospel of John opens by retelling our origin story from Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things that came into being came into being through him. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. They are his story, and he is moving forward the promises, and he is affirming God's saving purposes. He is here to rescue God's good creation out of the fall into sin, Satan, and death. It is a story of the redemption of the cosmos. It is about new creation. It is not the obliteration of our human existence or of the universe, but about it bringing, being brought into glory and the fulfillment of all that God intended it to be when he first created it. And when we go back into our origin story, into the book of Genesis, the truths that are given, the primary things of what it means to be human... That's what we're destined for. God said, let us make man or let us make humanity in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. You and I are called, we were created to have dominion, power and authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock, over all of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion, authorized power over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, over every living thing on the earth. I'm giving them every plant yielding seed on the face of the earth, every tree and seed. You shall have them for food and every beast of the earth. And we have this incredible power given to us. We were created as God's image bearers, created to exercise power and authority over all God's creation in God's name. Filling the earth, subduing it, caring and helping to bring order out of chaos. If not us, then who? We have a God-assigned purpose of bringing order out of chaos, of exercising power. How are we doing? Not so well. We made a mess of things. That's the story of the fall. But let's be clear. While we've made a mess of things, not everything that we do is wrong and not everything that we do is bad. There are things that we do and care about and truths that hold on to about us coming into this world. I, low hanging fruit. Do you have a pet? If you have a pet, you are exercising a little bit of the power that God intends you to have. And most likely, hopefully, you're a good pet owner. And, 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 and just in that small, simple thing, we get a picture. We humanize our pets, domestication. They, they become a little less beastly and they have a little bit more personality. But also there's this thing that goes on. We become a little bit more human. Um, so uh, this is a cat story. It's not even a dog story, but this is a cat story. I, I have both cats and dogs. I like both cats and dogs. I won't tell you which one I like more, but this is a cat story, and it's even a cat story. Um, on a Saturday night, a long time ago, not in a galaxy far, far away, my wife came in and said, our cat is stuck on top of the light post. Huh. Well, if he got up there, he can get down. No. He can't. Okay, we'll call the fire department. Sorry, we don't do animal rescue. Well, they don't do animal rescue. Well, he'll get down. I'm sleeping outside, and, and, and I'm like, oh, okay, I know where this is going. So I drive down to the church building. This is not west side. We have a 32-foot-long ladder 
at, it's an extension ladder right next to my office. I stick it on my little Geo Metro. It is longer than my car. And at 11.45 at night, I am climbing a ladder to rescue my cat. And you know what? Love calls us to do those sorts of things. Exactly what love is. And I looked a little bit more like Jesus because I was willing to risk my life to help protect something that I loved that was not just a thing, but it was my pet. And my wife was a part of that too. But there you go. When we were made for this, all over the place we are made to be exercising beneficial, loving, kind, good stewardship, demonstrating power, making life better. When we care for the earth, when we recycle, when we find ways to help produce power, which helps produce more food and more technology, which at its best can help make the world a better place, and we learn how to do this in clean ways that don't just add to pollution. And if you're part of any of that, you're doing part of the mandate. Christians should be known as being recyclers, of caring for the earth, of, of, of upholding the cause, of saying, let's make sure that we are good stewards of all of creation. And when we do that, we are living into God's created purposes for us. We must speak truth to power. And we must show a better way to exercise power. We were made to rule over the earth in the name of God. Second, and this is the most important reason, there is another way to exercise power that is fundamentally different than the world's way. This is what Jesus came to show us. This is part of what Jesus did. In John 18, where we were last week, when we were hearing about truth in the midst of the power, power delegated to Rome, and Pilate asked his question, what is truth? I want to read for you that fuller passage, because this is all about power. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And that's when Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now the cru crucial sentence in this dialogue between Jesus and Pilate is where it says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's actually a weak translation. The... the a better translation of this, and I'm going to say it that way, and I don't normally like to say it that way, but a better translation is, my kingdom is not from this world. Uh, there's a preposition, a Greek preposition, ek. It's, it means out of, originates from, comes from. It, it's getting used here. This isn't just a simple genitive where you would use of. He's giving direction. My kingdom does not come out of this world. And then he goes on and he says, if my kingdom came out of this world, if it was from here, my servants would have fought for me. Well, one of them tried to, used a sword, cut off somebody's ear, uh, Malchus, and then Jesus rebuked him for it. Because Jesus says, you know the way that the Gentiles lord it over and the way they exercise power over their subjects? Not so with you. And when Jesus made those comments to his disciples and they were wrangling over who would be first and who would be second and who gets the best seats in the house, Jesus comes back and he says, all of this stuff, the way that they exercise power, that is not the way for you to live. My kingdom, my power doesn't come from this world. This world's way of power is broken and lost. I remember when I first heard 
this passage and just hearing, my kingdom is not of this world. And if it were, and if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have fought for me. And I always pictured, oh yeah, the angels would have been here and they would have just wiped everybody out. And that's not what Jesus was getting at. The world uses the threat of death and coercive power and brute force to get its way. And Jesus says, that is not my kingdom. My kingdom doesn't come from this world that exercises power like that. If my servants were from this world, they would have done just what your servants would have, do, have done, and they would have fought. But see, my servants don't come from here. And later on, when Jesus prays for his disciples, and he's sitting there, this very same language of coming from the world, I'm not from the world, so the world hates me. Neither are my disciples from the world, so they hate the, my disciples. Because when you and I come into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We've been transferred from death to life, and we are now part of new creation. And this old world and its old way of doing power is no longer of us. It is hard to live this different way. Jesus spent three years telling about his kingdom, showing the way of power, true power, which doesn't use coercion and doesn't use violence. And his disciples never got it. Right at the end, Peter is brandishing a sword. They're full of bluster. Love may work around a table, but when you're in the outside world, reality interrupts and you better have a sword. But Jesus would say, not so. The kingdom of Jesus does not advance with a sword. Now, Let's be clear, I'm not advocating absolute pacifism. I believe that the best reading of the Bible supports governments utilizing power of the sword to restrain violence and evil. There is a place for the sword in society. Governments are supposed to exercise power on behalf of its citizens to protect and serve the greater good. And I believe that Christians can serve as police officers and even soldiers. But do not confuse the state for the church or the kingdom of God. And always be wary of the power of the state. Our power, the power of Jesus, the power that the church is supposed to exercise, doesn't come from this broken world. In John 12, Jesus explains the way of his kingdom and the way of godly power. There were some Greeks and they heard the claims, and they heard the miracles, and they, they sent forward questions, and they wanted to meet with Jesus. And in response to that, Jesus knew that the time was coming for him to die. And he said this, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus sat there and told Pilate, if my servants were from this world, they would have done it just like you guys do. But they're not. We go a different way. There's an interesting thing about the words for power. In the New Testament, the primary word, Jesus had power. We sang a song about the power of Jesus' name. And Jesus set people free from demon possession. He caused the blind to see, the lame to walk, the, the deaf to hear. He even raised people from the dead. He had power like the world did not know or see before. But all of that power gets described throughout the New Testament as excusia. The one who, is, who bears power out of the authority been given to him. 
This is not despotic power. This is not raw power. This is not just him exercising power for selfish ends. But everything he did, he did in response to the call of his father. And the way of this power was the willingness to suffer and to die. His greatest work is going to be like Moses' staff. He's going to get lifted up on a stick so that all people can lift their eyes and they can see and believe in the promise and be rescued and they can be rescued from the grip of the serpent's power which wants to take them into death. The only power that this world has, its greatest power, is the threat of death. And the way of Jesus Christ is a power that actually gives life to the dead. We can bring together Genesis and John. Humans are made to exercise power. But true human power, what God intends for us, was always exercised through self-giving love. When we perform that sort of power, when we enact acts of love, when we're willing to suffer for the sake of the good for others, human power works and it does not corrupt. Now, it doesn't always achieve instant results. The same way that threats and bullying and violence do in our world right now. In this fallen world, it's going to look weak and foolish. And there will be times when people will get frustrated and cynical and skeptical and they'll give up on this hard and difficult way of power. And sometimes it will look as if evil is triumphing. But the power of God... The power that Jesus wants to give us does not destroy us, but it sets us free. It empowers us to be who God created us to be. The other kind of power is tempting, but it is tempting like an addictive but lethal drug. And the world does not know a better way unless we show them the power that doesn't come from this world. It calls for courage. It calls for wisdom. So let me try to give you some biblical encouragement. You and I need to show a better way and we need to be willing to speak truth to power. Your weakness and failures do not disqualify you from God using you to exercise his power for the world. Every apostle failed Jesus the night of his arrest. They all fled, they all abandoned, they were all weak, they were all scared, they all left him, they all made promises, they all thought they would be better, and they all fell flat. And the most vocal and the most obvious was Peter. And John gives us Peter's story. Peter, so full of himself, we're going to go die He brandishes the sword to protect Jesus, but in the next moment, he is actually denying his Lord three times. That sword was not a sign of courage, but it was a sign of fear and desperation. And then after the resurrection, Jesus comes to Peter, and he confronts Peter with his failure. Just as Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus asked Peter, this is in John 21, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? Feed my lambs. And it ends up that Peter's failure was the doorway he had to walk through to let go of wielding the power of the world and to start responding to the call so that the power of Jesus could be worked in and through him. Peter finally set down the sword And he picked up a shepherd's staff. He listened to the call of Jesus. And now he starts exercising power as one under the authority of God. Our weaknesses and our failures do not disqualify us from service in Jesus' name. When we confess our inadequacy of trying to be in charge of our lives... When we actually come to the end of our own power and we realize that we've made a mess of things and we can actually confess this to Jesus, falling off your throne is a grace. It's the doorway in which now you can start to allow Jesus to be the leader of your life. It actually ends up qualifying us 
for being able to follow Jesus in the way of serving love. How do you embrace this? How do we live it? Let me put forward a challenge. I think the grace that you and I have received, because we've all fallen short, we've all failed in some way, we all have weakness, and we can't do it by ourselves, it needs to start informing the way that we see the brokenness around us. God, Jesus Christ, is fundamentally for people. He is not against them. He wants to be with us forever, not separated. He moved heaven and earth to enact a rescue operation, and his target was the whole world. You and I, we are stand in the beneficiaries of his grace. But are there people in your life that you perhaps assume or perhaps act as if God is not for them? I mean, have you ever had that thought in your mind that there's no possible way that God can be for those people over there? I mean, this is what our world is doing, right? How could God possibly be with those Republicans? Or how could possibly be with those Democrats? Or how could God possibly be with that BMLL stuff? Or how could possibly be with those mega-wearing things? And whatever your reaction is to those people where you have this sense of just disgust, we've got to start looking at those people as people that Jesus loved and died for and wants to be with forever. And their mistakes and failures no more disqualify them than they did for us. Every person who finally sets down the fallen powers of this world and begins to wield the serving love of Christ is the very reason the church of Jesus Christ has been left here on earth. We want to see all of these people saved. Jesus wants to see all of these people saved. Who are the people that you're tempted to think there is no possible way for God to be with those people or for those people? If you can identify somebody or some group, let me challenge you with this. Open up your heart by practicing hospitality towards that person. Now that things are starting to open up, now that we're getting in the place where people are starting to get inoculated and hopefully, you know, we can go to some restaurants and we can meet with people and we don't have to just do Zoom meetings anymore. What if you were to invite somebody that was on the other side that you didn't think that God would be for and you just get to know them and you just practice simple hospitality of trying to just get across this divide and then just listen and get to know this human being who's created in God's image. The goal of this is not to prove you're right and they're wrong. It isn't to corner them so that you can preach to them. The reason we practice hospitality is to open our hearts to others the way that God has opened his heart to us. Henry Nouwen wrote, Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. And sometimes the change has to take place in me, and I didn't even know it. So, your weakness and failures don't disqualify you, and they don't disqualify others. And then second, don't worry if you look foolish. These are Paul's words at the beginning of 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligence I will frustrate. Where is the wide person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Remember... 
They dressed Jesus up as a king of fools. They stuck a crown of thorns on his head and they wrapped a robe around him and they bowed bound before him and they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they stood up and they struck him in the face and they spit on him. And Jesus took it all, even though he was the king of the entire universe. While he was hanging on the cross, there were those in the crowds who said, If you're really the Son of God, then why don't you come down from that cross and prove it? And he refused to come down from that cross because he was committed to saving everyone who would believe. And he wants all people to be saved. He wants all people to be believe. There are two different types of power. And they are fundamentally opposed to one another. When you practice one, you will look foolish to the other. So let me challenge you. Follow Jesus. You will look foolish to the world, but not to God. How do we embrace this? We choose to be guided by love and not by fear. We choose to be guided by love and not by fear. When we start fearing the world's opinions, where they think that we're foolish and then we start acting to try to please the world, our focus becomes fear and not love. God doesn't call us to fear. He calls us to love. Let me give you... A very practical example. Right now in our society, we have the opportunity to get vaccinated. And there is a lot of fear out there and there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of other things that people are focusing on. And there's people who are choosing to say, there's no possible way I'm getting a vac vaccination for whatever reason. Now, I cannot guarantee the future to you as far as what happens from that vaccine. But what I can guarantee is this. Our focus is supposed to be on love. And so the first opportunity that I had, because I'm going to try to be a good citizen, when I finally was approved to go get my vaccine, I went and got it. I'm not really worried about getting COVID. Maybe I should be. I don't know. But what I'm really worried about is loving people. And I know that the sooner that we get to have um, herd immunity, the closer we'll go back to normal. And, you know, some of the people in my life have sat there and said, but we don't know all of the side effects and consequences. It's true. This is new. We've, we've rushed through it, but we've used the very best science. We've, it's different than any other sort of vaccine that we've ever done. It's not putting a little bit of the virus into us. It's a whole new technology. It's quite amazing. And so there's every good reason to believe that it's not only going to work, but it's not going to be harmful. But I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about love. And I can't control the future, but I can control my choice today. So I'm not going to focus on fears and what ifs and maybe and, well, maybe my life will get shortened by 10, 15, 20 years. Who knows? I could get hit by a car tomorrow. My attitude is not getting shaped by the world and the world's opinion. It's going to be shaped by what God says and his call. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am called to love. And so in every opportunity, I'm going to try to do that. Don't worry if the world looks down on us. Because the way up is down. John gives us this powerful picture of the Last Supper where Jesus, listen to these words. In this Last Supper, the evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon and Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And he had come from God and he was returning to God. He had absolute authority. All power belongs to him. And so he got up. From the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet. Drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. Taking the position of the lowest slave in the household. All authority and power submitted to God and used for service. 
And you bet the world will look down on us when we live out the power of Jesus Christ. Don't worry about people looking down on you. Embrace it. Jesus has sent us into the world to bring his power, his truth, his love to a lost and dying world. He has shown us the way and there is a definite posture that us, his followers, should adopt. It is a posture of loving service where I get down and I serve and this is what I do. I am absolutely free. I've been set free from Christ and no one has mastery over me but Jesus alone. And yet I am called to be a servant of all because I've been set free into love. And that is what love does. Jesus is there and he is bending down to make them clean. He is looking to serve and not be served. We live in a world that uses people. We're not going to use people. We live in a world that reduces people to skin color, political party, nationality, economic, pla- economic class. But you and I, as followers of Jesus, we're not going to prejudge people and put them in these little categories. Every person is created in the image of God. If you judge people, Mother Teresa says, you have no time to love them. In our society, Christians are known for what we are against. We need to be known for what we're for. And we're for people. And we're for love. And we're for service. So don't let your weakness and your failures disqualify you because they don't. You will look foolish to the world, but you won't look foolish to God. And remember that the way up is the way down. So here's my question. Whose power are you going to exercise this week? Whose truth are you going to proclaim to power this week? This week, you're going to have an opportunity to make a choice. Am I going to employ worldly power? Or am I going to go to the way of Jesus And start bringing his power to the world. You know, this isn't about being heroic. This isn't about all of us having to, you know, this week do something where we start a movement that changes the whole world. I heard a story from one of our members last week and it brought tears to my eyes. A couple is helping a young man who has a drug addiction. And, um, you know, they, they sacrificed time and energy and they got in the car and they drove to go pick him up. Why'd they do it? Because Jesus' love compelled them to do it. They don't owe this man anything except the call that Jesus has on their lives. I remember talking to another friend and... Um, you know, he was experienced deep racism in his childhood. His family had to flee the South because, um, because he was black and because somebody was raped. And father went and beat up the person who raped his wife and they had to flee for their lives. And his only experience of white people up to that point was just hatred. And then he went to a middle school and he had a teacher who was white cared for him, gave extra time, met with him after class, changed his life, not only helped him have an education, but showed him that white people can care. I don't know what your opportunity is this week, but I'm sure that in some way you have the opportunity to speak truth to power and more importantly, show the way of power. It's going to be by getting on your knees. It's going to be by loving. It's going to be by, it may be through suffering. And nobody else may see it, understand it, or get it, but God will. So go live for him. Let us pray. 
You came into the world with all power and authority. You are the one being in the universe who has the power to force us all. And yet you refuse to force anyone. Instead, you bend down, you get dirty, you love, you serve, you give, you suffer, you die, that we might live. And then you tell us this is the way to really live. So Lord, be glorified and may we live for you. Amen.